exactly three left. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So shall we start? Yeah. Of course, sir. Yeah. Am I on time? Am I on time? Yes. Participants are requested to kindly turn off their microphones and camera. I repeat, participants are requested to turn off your microphones and camera. Good afternoon. Suspected resource persons and participants, it's a joy and pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all to the inaugural edition of the online national lecture series organized by the Department of Economics, Mahatma College, Thiruvalla. The department, being the oldest one in the college, has always been in the forefront in initiating various academic activities. The COVID pandemic has certainly put some constraints in organizing events in regular ways. Fortunately, the platforms for academic discussions and deliberations still exist through virtual means. The online national lecture series is an initiative of the department to convert challenges as opportunities. Prayer is the means of submitting ourselves before the Almighty and it's a meditation to refresh our minds. I request Ms. Ashwarya of 3rd B Economics to lead us in prayer with a prayer song. Ankila chara chara rikshida deva Anta mulya ngale ali ikki deva Alala geni ki ali ikki ki Sakala toba ginga plegi vada Krishna nam kristu Thank you, Ashwadi. Now, I invite Mr. Anup Koshi George, Assistant Professor of the Department and the Coordinator of this program, to welcome all respective guests for the day. Am I audible? Yes. Thank you, sir. Respected Principal Dr. Vogis Matthew, distinguished guests for the day, the Vice Chairman of Kerala State Planning Board, Dr. P. K. Ramajandran, sir, moderator of the event and former principal of St. Thomas College, Karanjiri, Dr. P. J. Philip, respected teachers, your research scholars, students, and all well wishers of the department. A very good afternoon to all. The COVID 19 pandemic has made a distant possibility in the recent past become a new normal in the present with a very short time span. The pandemic is not just another disease, but it affected human life in every dimension. The economy is being hit severely as man could hardly get involved in his labor. The rising issues of unemployment and poor economic performances all over the world points to an uncertain future. These challenging times demand better involvement from academic fraternity, particularly the scholars and researchers in economics, to suggest policies for overcoming these adverse times. The Department of Economics, Marthama College, Tiruvalla, want to make use of this challenge as an opportunity by providing a platform 
for discussion and analysis on the challenges and the prospects of the global as well as the national economy. The first edition of the online national lecture series is an initiative of the department in this regard. The theme for this lecture series is the impact of COVID-19 on macroeconomic variables, national and international perspective. I consider this as a privilege and honor to welcome you all to this online national lecture series on the behalf of Department of Economics, Madhama College, Kirivella. Respected Principal Dr. Wolf Matthew, with his able leadership and hardworking nature, is taking the college forward in these challenging times. It is his motivation and enthusiasm that strengthened us to organize this event. Since joining as a faculty of the college, Sir always took an effort to keep in good touch with the department and participated wholeheartedly in all activities of the department. On behalf of the department and all present in the meeting, I extend a very warm welcome to our beloved principal, Dr. Valdis Matthew. The distinguished guest for the day, Vice Chairman of Kerala State Planning Board, Dr. V.K. Ramachandran, sir. Sir has been so kind enough to accept our invitation. First of all, I wish to express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Ramachandran, sir, for accepting our invitation in spite of this busy schedule. Words may be insufficient to express his contributions to the field of economics, a great academician with international repute and recognitions. His contributions are in the areas of agrarian issues and has to credit several works on agrarian questions and rural development issues and on such varied subjects as education, labor, class, caste, gender discrimination, and social oppression. So always try to address the economic issues of common man through his studies and writings. He has been a visiting professor at several national and international universities and was a professor and head of economic analysis unit, Indian Statistical Institute, Bangalore, and had earlier served as the member of the West Bengal and Tribura State Planning Boards. He has been a member of editorial boards of several, several internationally acclaimed journals. I consider this as, as an honor and privilege to have Dr. V.K. Ramachandran, sir, the vice chairman of the Kerala State Planning Board, to deliver the inaugural lecture of the online national lecture series of the department on the topic Kerala Economic Initiative during the COVID pandemic. Sir, on the behalf of the Department of Economics, I once again express our sincere gratitude for accepting our invitation and also extend a very warm welcome to this lecture series. The moderator of the event, Respector Dr. P.J. Philipsa, former principal of St. Thomas College, Corinji. Sir is a well-wisher of the department who stood with us in all times. He's a person to whom we can look up to for support and guidance. It is his willingness and support that helped in elevating the department as a research center of Mahatma Gandhi University in the year 1998. Besides being a great scholar and academician, he is also an able administrator. So we are very much glad to have you as a moderator for the event. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. And on the behalf of the department, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. P.J. Philip. I also extend words of welcome to the members of the Office of Vice Chairman, especially Dr. Harshan, and I thank them for their support in organizing the program. A special word of gratitude to Dr. I.C.K. John, former principal of this college, for his wholehearted support and also extend a hearty welcome. Our former principal, Dr. Abraham Job, is also with I extend a warm welcome to Sir also. Next, I welcome all participants, including all teachers of various departments of the college, of the of, of, uh, faculty members of the department, retired teachers of the department and the college, teachers and students of various colleges inside and outside Kerala, research scholars of the department and various other centers, and students of the department and the college. I hope this three-day lecture series will enlighten you with better insights about future prospects in this challenging time. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to all. Thank you. Thank you, Anupsa. Our beloved principal, Dr. Vergis Matthew, is the greatest source of support and inspiration for all our activities of the department. I humbly request the respected principal to mention his remarks. Respected Chief Guest, Dr. V.K. Ramadan Sir, Vice Chairman, Kerala State Planning Board, 
Dr. P.J. Felusa, former principal, Senvas College of Cordoncheri, Dr. Abraham George Sir, Dr. I.C.K. John Sir, former principals, Martha College of Thiruvalla, other department, Professor Rajiv Matthew, the convert of this program, Professor Anu Koshi George, uh, Professor Arvind Shankar, Dr. Vinu Govind, faculty from various institutions, postdoctoral fellows, research scholars, and dear students. Greetings, greetings from Martha Kulathiruvella. I congratulate the Department of Economics for organizing this three day online lecture series. Said so today we have an important personality, Dr. V.K. Tambatan, sir. Sir, we are very happy that he is an uh, economist and an other to, to say about the present economic conditions of Kerala and the general in the wake of COVID-19. On behalf of Martha Makoji community, I sincerely thank, I sincerely welcome you, sir, to the virtual platform of this program. Also, I welcome former principal, uh, Dr. P.J. Phillips, sir, uh, Abraham George, sir, and also I.C.K. John, sir, to this online platform. Department of Economics is one of the best departments this college. The department offers UG, PG, uh, PhD programs, and uh, certificate programs. It is an active research department that produces several PhDs. Every year, the department conducts an annual lecture on on relevant topics. I am very happy to say that former principals Dr. Abraham George and Dr. Isaac John were from this department. The college obtained a lot of laurels under their leadership, including a grade in NAP accreditation. The college maintains a grade in the fourth cycle of NAP accreditation, also placed 84th position in All India NIRF ranking uh, 2020. The college backed eight ranks in the MG University degree results of this year. Thanks to Dr. Isaac John for all these achievements and the leadership he rendered to the college for the last uh, three years. COVID-19 pandemic has affected all sectors of the world, including education. Education institutions were closed on 17th March 2020 due to lockdown. There is no way to function the educational institutions in a normal way due to restrictions and uh, COVID-19 protocol. Day by day, the case of COVID-19 patients are increasing in an exponential growth. It is the nature of human being to overcome all type of hurdles. Concerning this reality, the college have been organizing online seminars or lecture series. Online classes of the college are being conducted regularly from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. as per timetable through Microsoft Teams. Also, all other academic activities are through online platforms. COVID-19 pandemic has affected the economic economy everywhere. Kerala state has witnessed the threats of floods in the year 2018 and 2019. It affected the economic growth of Kerala like anything. The monsoon induced floods in Kerala has severe repercussions on the state economy. It was reported that 2.2 percentage of the state's annual GDP has been, has been impacted in the financial year 2019. The fiscal deficit of the state has exceeded 5% in 2019 due to the lack of central uh, granting aid. The key sectors in, in the Kerala economy are tourism and the agro-based industries. These sectors were affected drastically due to flood. Now comes COVID-19 in 2020. It also affected our, our economy like anything. It affected all sectors, namely tourism, industry, shops, self-made business, uh, farmers, etc. Also, in the wake of COVID-19, the central government has introduced national education policy 2020, farmers bill, etc. This will also affect our states in different ways. So the topic of this uh, webinar is 11 and up. I conclude, I wish all success for the seminar have a nice time with Martha Mukherjee. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. We have with us an eminent scholar, accomplished academician, and an able administrator, Dr. P.J. Philip, former principal of St. Thomas College, Corangeri. With great respect, I invite sir to moderate the session. Thank you. <laughs> I will be brief in my remarks. Our esteemed guest will be presenting a general paper on the COVID-19 initiatives of Kerala, its uh, uh, impacts and analysis of the various uh, initiatives the government of Kerala has taken. I was uh, reading Hindu newspaper today and there were two doctors commenting on the present uh, COVID growth in India, stating that around 45% of the population of the country are inflicted by this uh, uh, disease when some are not uh, positive, but a lot of people have this uh, virus going through their body and so on. And they say that after three months, it will increase to 70% of the Indian population. We can understand the volume of uh, uh, contraction, the economic and social and the activities of the country if this happens for three months or six months. So Kerala uh, being uh, a state which always take a pride in initiating some novel programs whereby the, uh, the, uh, the difficulties of such uh, pandemics can be mitigated. Still, Kerala is uh, experiencing great difficulties in financial sectors, as we all know, the volume of uh, income, state uh, finances has dwindled, the total volume of economic productivity has contracted, and uh, the people in, in Gulf countries, they are also coming back in large numbers. So, so the, the consumption pattern of Kerala and the income pattern all are going through a very great stress. We have a planning board which has been in the forefront of initiating dynamic programs during the last uh, so many decades. I um, mean, the initiative of the planning board using the resources, scanned resources in such a way with the help of uh, uh, panchayats, with the help of uh, NGOs and with, with the help of other organizing agencies, we are able to minimize the our educational sector, our health sector, part of our states. And in such an emergent situation, they have been able to deliver great uh, help to the people. I know Dr. Ramachandran is a visionary in the field of uh, public finance and initiatives in uh, governmental activities. So he, he will be having a lot to talk to us. And uh, after that, we will have uh, uh, some questions asked to him, and then we will conclude. So I invite uh, Dr. Yamendran to being in this uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can yes, I sir. be heard clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. If anyone has any problem, could you raise it now with with the audio? You can all hear department and okay. So let me. Yes, sir. It's clear. It's clear and audible. Thank you, Dr. P. J. Philip, Dr. Philip, Dr. Vargis Matthew, Professor Anup Koshi George, uh, young Ms. Ashwati who sang the prayer song. Uh, all members of the faculty of the Postgraduate and Research Department of Economics, all teachers of economics, all other teachers, educators, educationists, and of course, most important, my young student colleagues. I am very grateful to the Postgraduate and Research Department of Economics at the Marthoma College, Thiruvilla, for having invited me to present this 
first edition of your online national lecture series. I understand it's, it's a three-day webinar starting today. I wish you all, I wish you all good, uh, uh, give you all my good wishes for this effort. And uh, I hope that when, uh, when times improve and we return to some kind of uh, normalcy, I shall be able to visit your department as well. I look forward to that. It would be wonderful to see your, uh, your department. We have a, uh, do I take it that most of the audience are students? Is that in, in the composition, uh, Dr. Philip Joseph, Dr. Varghis Matthew, are, is the composition of this audience mainly students? Yes. May I? Yes. It is. It is mainly students, is it? And, sir. and these are undergraduate and postgraduate students and research students? May I? I'm asking a question. These are mostly. Okay. Uh, mostly. Okay. That's all right. Yeah, fine. Please tell me. Now, let's begin. On January uh, yes, 30th. Sir, it includes students yeah. and research scholars, maybe. And research scholars, okay. Yeah. Now, I look forward to meeting the students and research scholars, as I said, at some time in the future. Yeah. On January. Graduate and undergraduate students, sir. Okay, yeah, good. As I said, I hope I hope to visit sometime your your department on um, on January thirtieth, two thousand twenty twenty. The fa first case of COVID nineteen in India was identified in Kerala. The interesting thing about this particular phenomenon was that it reflected many things. On the one hand, it reflected the the windows that are the connections that Kerala has with the rest of the world. Uh, it, a young student from uh, from China who had come back from Wuhan who had come back was diagnosed as being COVID positive. The and it is not surprising that we have because we have a large part of our people, a large number of our people study in different parts of the world and work in different parts of the world. It's not surprising that it came from Kerala. It's also not one more th feature of the situation was that when the COVID positive case was detected in Kerala, the government was already aware of the need to track the possible patients returning to Kerala from different places and to track our population for COVID positive patients. This has been because of our experience, not only our recent experience with NIPA, but because of the fact that Kerala has a unique strength of a well-established public health system and of decentralized government, which has stood us in good stead even very recently during the period of the NIPA, uh, NIPA virus. So by the time when the director of the general, when the director general of the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be an international pandemic. That was March 11, 2020. By that time, Kerala was more or less on its toes. It was, it was, ready, it was ready to respond to the situation. Given the, of course, there were many unknowns. We, were st we still did not know how long it would last. What were the details? What were the various ramif ramifications of this disease and of this that the pandemic would take? But nevertheless, all of you will remember that by March 11, Kerala was well aware and ready to the extent possible in the circumstances to meet the challenge. Now, as uh, both Mr. Anup Koshi George and uh, Dr. Philip and Dr. Varghese Matthew indicated, this is an unprecedented challenge. It's a challenge on a scale, a public health uh, challenge on a scale that the world, on a scale that the world has not seen since the early part of the 20th century, when we had the international flu epidemic, pandemic. But um, from the very subject as it was set for me from the, uh, by the Matama College, uh, 
Department of Economics. It is clear that our response to the pandemic can broadly be seen in two terms. One is the public health response, the health, uh, you know, health, public health, um, curative health, preventive health, the uh, the policies regarding, say, quarantining, the policies regarding lockdowns, and so on. Th that is that is one set of issues which requires its own expertise and indeed is being dealt with people who are experts in that field. It has another aspect. It has the aspect of keeping alive. It has a public policy. The second public policy aspect is the economics aspect. Keeping alive livelihood opportunities. Making sure that the economic needs of the population are met, not only during a period of pandemic, but also during a period of unprecedented lockdown. Now, Kerala, as you are aware, is in the last few years, it is not a stranger to uh, public health uh, crises and to indeed to uh, natural disasters. We have had, we had in, during the space of this government alone, we've had the Oki crisis, we've had the extreme rainfall events of 2018 and 2019, uh, accompanied by, particularly by large-scale floods in the first instance, and large-scale floods and land mudslides in the second instance. We have had, uh, we've had uh, excess rainfall in certain pockets this year. We've also had a series of economic uh, shocks to the system. One was, uh, for instance, the shock to, to the system that came from demonetization, the shock to the system that came from the transition to GST. So we have, this economy has taken a lot of, uh, shall we say, different blows to the economy over the last five year period. And yet there was something which was very specific about this pandemic. Uh, I, I'm sure the students here can think about it and I can react to that. The very fact that the pandemic, the early stages of pandemic, were accompanied by total lockdown and since then has been accompanied in different to different degrees by different degrees of lockdown and different degrees of containment make it a very, very specific phenomenon that is different from the other kinds of natural disasters and, um, and shocks that the system has endured over the last few years. Now, previous disasters, as I said, were mainly natural disasters. When the economy suffered damage to its pr productive capacity over a specific time, with measur measurable consequences in the short and medium term. We had so many days of rain, so many days of, of water logging and excess rainfall, and we were able to calculate what kind of damage occurred because, for instance, of the 2018 rainfall. But in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, and particularly the first lockdown, the production of goods and services came to an abrupt and almost complete halt. And at that time, we didn't know how long the halt would, uh, would, would, would be for. The halt to production during COVID-19 pandemic, production and services, was not locality specific or, or scale specific. In other words, it affected big industry, it affected small industry. It affected, uh, it affected Kasaragod, it affected Tarandra. It affected all sections of the population. And uh, so its effects were from top to bottom across all locations. There is also there was uncertainty much more than even now about how long it will take for the production system and the system of creation of livelihoods to recover over this whole period. Now, how long? We still cannot. We have some. We have some pockets. I'll come to that of recovery. But nevertheless, we still cannot say uh, how long will it take for us to be able to um, come completely to what somebody called a, a new normal, but to the post what we can call a post-COVID scenario. We still don't completely know. 
that's associated not with the development of the vaccine. It's associated with the development of prevention with, with a large number of variables. Now, suppose you were to organize it. Let's take an example. Suppose you were to organize a conference on February 1st. Till today, you cannot tell whether that's going to be an online conference or a, or a, or a physical conference. How, how much physical, uh, how much of our future dealings will be on site, how much online? These are still very much uncertain because there is also uncertainty as to when we will be, be able to achieve in all previous, in, uh, in any substantial or equivalent degree, previous levels of production. With that, this is because the recovery of national and international supply and distribution chains, there's uncertainty there. And unless you are able to revive national, international, and local level production and uh, supply and distribution chains, you can't revive production. So the uncertainties involved in, the, uh, in this pandemic, the very specific economic problems that have come to us as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic have been extraordinary. My, I want to submit to you that I've, I believe that there are certain aspects of our governance and our, our system in Kerala that have prepared us for this. And I'll come to that mainly at the end. But please remember that there were economies that some of the most powerful economies in the world, the United States, the United Kingdom, these were economies which, and societies which took a great deal of time to respond. It's, uh, now look at the United States. At, from the top echelons, even, even now there's, you know, we, we know that uh, part of, one of the most important aspects of the public debate in the United States is whether the, the government ha has, has in fact a coherent response to this crisis. I think that in certain ways, Kerala was uniquely, uniquely equipped not to, not to, to confront this challenge in a modern, rational, and democratic way. Let me go into that. Now, so early on, we had the, uh, we had our, uh, the pandemic was announced to be an international, uh, to be an international pandemic by the uh, WHO. The government of India announced a, a lockdown. And in fact, the major features of the lockdown were already in place in Kerala by the time the national lockdown started. And that was considered necessary. Now, there were about three or four immediate policy responses to this initial crisis that won Kerala international recognition, and I think, set us apart from most areas, many parts of the world in, uh, in terms of a democratic response to this crisis. The first was this. The government determined that no person during this period is going to go hungry. That is number one. No person would go hungry and some subsistence money would come into the hands of the people. This was our first, uh, our first point. And uh, we, we, you know, uh, there were welfare, welfare pensions were paid in, in advance to beneficiaries. Relief payments were announced to those not eligible for pension. Special assistance of a thousand rupees was dis distributed to members enrolled under the welfare fund boards. The relief covered workers in agriculture, shops, tailoring, cashew, handloom, toddy, plantation, kayar, construction. And um, in addition, we created a safety net of essential commodities and services. Uh, this was both in the form of, of kits, groceries, and subsidized meals. So we, we were the first state to distribute free rations to all, all categories of ration card holders. We gave free rations to some 87.28 black ration card holders during the lock, lockdown. And uh, the network... The, our network of fair price shops played a very crucial uh, role in this. And below poverty line, uh, 
uh, card holders got a special supply. Now, now this has gone on. This uh, this commitment to not allowing people to go hungry or completely without any resources in their hands that has continued. That was our first determination, and I think that really set us apart from the rest of the country. But the second, where we said that everybody would get. Some kind of shelter, some kind of shelter was was assured. This was particularly in the case of our what we call our guest workers. Our, I think one of the lasting images, international images, of uh, the pandemic and the first lockdown internationally was these the heartbreaking scenes of migrant workers walking, say, from Mumbai to to, to Bihar. From Delhi across to Eastern India, this kind, this uh, act of of it is of shall we say uh, organized heartlessness. You know, this was this was something which simply did not occur in our state. We did not allow. Of course, we had we had to overcome many difficulties in that period, but but nevertheless, behaved with the workers who have helped build our country. Build construction have worked so hard for our for the economy of our state. We stood by our duties in terms of their rehabilitation, their uh, and their residence and settlement. That is the second. The third very important aspect of our policy was that everyone had access to medical care. See, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many of you. Have been, I'm sure all of you, many of you, have been in touch with your friends and peers from different parts of the country. But I know that, and I have, I, as somebody mentioned, I was, I have been, you know, I have worked with the planning board of different states, and I've been a, a resident. I worked in the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta and in, in Mumbai, and speaking to my colleagues in these places. One thing which came out was we always knew what to do. If we get, if we showed symptoms, we knew which number to call. We knew where to go. We were given instructions. This uh, confidence in our healthcare system, this ability to gain access to healthcare, this fear. That you know you will not get healthcare because you don't have the money for it does not did not exist in the state. This is the second, third aspect of our immediate response to the um, immediate, but that has that immediate response also has had me medium term and long term implications. Response to the pandemic. So first was food and basic subsistence. The second was some kind of shelter, including for our uh, guest workers. The third is access to medical care. The fourth is access to information. I've already touched on that. That has a lot to do both with our democratic stru structures, our decentralized uh, governance, from the highest levels of government, that is, from the chief minister to the to the most local, to your ward level. Information is provided to the people of Kerala from their elected representatives and for and by government. That is, as to what to do, what is banned, what is what is permitted, what can be done. Uh, how do if you are you know if you ha have a, if you are in a crisis situation, what do you do? How can you respond? So, these four: access to food and subsistence, access to shelter, access to medical care, and access to information. This is the early part of the response, and this is what put India. Uh, Kerala on India's map and on the map of the world in the early stages of the uh, COVID-19 response. response. Um, I would like for those who, who for those uh, who are not familiar, we had uh, the government. I had uh, the government of Kerala had organized a series of interviews and discussions at the early phase of this. It was in. July, July, June, July. No? 
in July with uh, some very eminent personalities, including economists and social scientists and scientists in different parts of the world. Uh, immediately after this phase, during this phase of this uh, of the pandemic, one of the people was uh, the the only Indian Nobel Prize winner in economics, Professor Amartya Sen. One of the uh, respondents was uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, one I mean, one of, who's one of the uh, most respected voices of political commentary in the world. We had uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, uh, again a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Uh, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who is the chief scientist of the WHO, and Professor Venki Ramakrishnan, who is the head of the uh, the president of the Royal Society and a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, all commenting on the post-COVID situation and the kinds of things that they were seeing happening in Kerala at that point. These are all available online, and I'm happy to send to you uh, a principal or uh, program coordinator uh, the the links for this. Please, you can take it from, from the office. Uh, uh, my office will send it to your office. And I urge the students here to look at some of the things that people like uh, Professor Sen, Professor Stiglitz, Professor Chomsky and others had to say about how economists should respond to this entire crisis. Now, this was the early stage of the crisis. What we did was, as soon as the early stage, during the early stages, the planning board, we tried to conduct an assessment, a quick assessment of losses to the economy. Um, again, I'm happy to give you, this is on our website, if you want to see that uh, report. You see, the, the first impact hmm, of the pandemic and subsequent lockdown were on industries, uh, on sectors, like industry, agriculture, construction, tourism, information technology, uh, energy, fisheries, animal husbandry, all of these felt the first impact of the uh, of the, the withdrawal of production and the withdrawal of economic activity and the withdrawal of the labor force. So these, um, and as you know, many of these are very important to Kerala's uh, economy. And of course, some, I think, uh, was it uh, Professor Anup Koshi George who mentioned the importance of these sectors in our economy? The, we uh, estimated that for the month of March 2020, hmm, assuming uh, about 10 days of total production loss and decreased economic activity from the middle of March, the shortfall in value addition to the state in the early stages was about 29,000 crores. Hmm? And the losses for the first quarter of 2021 were estimated to be roughly 80,000 crores. This we did by a uh, both by a macro level assessment and by sectoral sectoral studies. The second version, uh, the second round of uh, computation of the losses to our state economy in the first two quarters will be available soon. We are now still working on it. But this gives you an idea of... Uh, now, in addition, since the outbreak of COVID-19, 4.81 lakh emigrants have returned to Kerala, of whom uh, from different parts, from, from January to August 2020. Of them, 56% have lost their jobs. The World Bank's forecast estimates that there, would, that there will be a decline in, remittance, in remittances to India to the tune of 23% in 2020, owing to the... Uh, owing to the uh, the pandemic. So now, we, as I said, our first response was to put, was these four, was guided by these four principles. And we put together in May 2020, a first package of 20,000 crores. Now, what we did was, now what, what is the next step? The first step, as I said, was to ensure food, subsistence, shelter, uh, medical care, and information to the people. The next was uh, 
to slowly attempt to create livelihoods and employment opportunities in those sectors where it was safe to do so in the present circumstances. So we sought to extend, to create new employment and livelihood opportunities. And uh, we, we first started by providing loans worth about 2,000 crores to self-help groups under Kudumashri. Now, this was known as the Chief Minister's Helping Hand Loan Scheme. And it's a microcredit facility, a credit facility. And uh, there would be a tenure of the loan was about 36 months with an initial moratorium period of, the, of six months. And we also set aside an additional 2,000 crores for the employment guarantee scheme. Our, in order to not only to revive production along with employment and livelihoods, we began by introducing two new uh, programs. Well, uh, these were what we call convergence programs in agriculture and industry. The agricultural convergence program is called Subhiksha Kerala, as you probably know. It aims at enhancing food production, uh, particularly in food grain and vegetable production in the state. And it, it brings together agriculture farmers and farmers' welfare animal husbandry, dairy development, fisheries, cooperation, water resources, industries, because industries deals with agro-processing, and our local self-government to provide credit, marketing, and irrigation support. The project attempts to uh, extend cultivation in fallow lands, increase the incomes of farmers, and attract return migrants and young people to agriculture in this period. So Subhiksha Kerala has been so once this first crisis, where we instituted our first four principles, was, was taken care of, we then turned our, our attention to livelihoods and production. And to extend the next was to extend support to non-resident Keralites. We took not only to affect them to take to try to help them in this time of crisis, but also to, off to offer uh, economic assistance. We, the, the government gave 5,000 uh, to people who were unable to go back to work. Un under the Santunam project, relief was given to expatriates who tested positive. We uh, also provided uh, emergen emergency loans as seed capital for self-employment enterprises with subsidies on capital and interest. In addition, we tried to. I have about five minutes left. I'll, I'll do that. We tried to extend the time limits for the payment of charges due to the government. Finally, so these were. This was the set of econo immediate economic measures, short and medium term economic measures. I told you those first four principles, and then the revival of livelihoods and production as the economy slowly started opening up, relaxing aspects of lockdown. Now, what we did was, oh, I forgot one thing. We have a in the industries, uh, scheme for industries also, reviving production in, uh, in agriculture and through Subhiksha Kerala, and for the revival of micro, small, and medium enterprises, what we call MSMEs, through what we call Devasaya Bhadrada, that scheme. So those have been our two major production schemes. The uh, what we next did was the the government instructed uh, the planning board then to uh, I think I, uh, was it uh, Professor Philip who uh, who mentioned the uh, the the financial straits in which every state government finds itself the. What we did was, we tried to, the, all the schemes of the plan of 2021, of uh, 2020 to 2021, we have a series of plan schemes. We sequenced them. We prioritized, prioritized the sequence of the implementation of these plans, the recommended implementation of these different schemes. So the prioritizing and sequencing of the use plan resources through schemes 
we address that problem in order to use our resources effectively. Now, I want to, uh, for the students here, I want to give you, I want to tell you two things. See, and uh, much of this the teachers will know. See, one thing is that um, in India, this is something I used to teach. <laughs> this is something which I used to teach before I came here. But, and uh, the, the major tasks, if you look at our constitution, the major tasks of what we used to call nation building are with the states, agriculture, industry, higher education, school education, hmm? roads, take a, take a construction, take a whole range, fisheries, animal husbandry, youth affairs, all of these are uh, uh, the responsibility of the states, and correctly, correctly so, because it is the state governments which know the situation on the ground and can deal with this. Nevertheless, the finances, uh, the great asymmetry in our constitutional system is the finances for these are overwhelm overwhelmingly in the hands of the center or the central government. So to be able to prioritize, to, we in Kerala, we have decided to retain the process of planning because given this situation, given the perpetual shortage, given this perpetual asymmetry, shall I say, between the duties of the state and the resources at its command, we believe that a planned, a system of planning, the, a consultative planning in which the people play a role, huh, is the most important instrument of trying to mitigate the effects of this asymmetry. Now, let me tell you one. I'm, what is special about Kerala's response? I'm, uh, let me ask uh, uh, any student is free to reply. Have you, is uh, the work of Amartya Sen part of your course? Who part of your course? Any student want to reply to that? Is the work of Professor Sen part of your BA or MA courses? Huh? Anila, Anila is replying. Huh? Anila is yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. What, did you, what, what is what is it? What did, in your PG, in your undergraduate? Are you a student, uh, is Anila? No, I am a teacher. You're a teacher. Okay. Uh, what is undergrads? What did they learn of Amartya's Amartya Sen's Amartya Sen's Capability, work? capability approach. Oh, you do the capability approach in undergrads? Huh? Yeah. Yes, sir. And what do the uh, this thing do? What do the uh, uh, what do you do in the PG level? PG level also they have capability approach in a, a little more detailed manner. They have you basically do capabilities as part of your development economic course. Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. How, then how basically, you, do you, let me ask the students again, the students or faculty. Do you study Amartya Sen's work on public action? Do you study Amartya? Ms. Anila? Do you? No, sir. No. no. Okay. Okay. Then let me let me go. That's very. I believe that's. It's a. It gives us a very good framework of understanding some of the Kerala's response to different uh, crises and why we have been able to deal with crises in a way that I mean I'm I'm not criticizing our brother states, but the other you have. Swapnali Barua. Swapnali Barua, where are you from? Where have you joined us from? I get a, I'm getting a chat here from Swapnali Barua. Where are you speaking from, uh, Swapnali? Uh, there's a chat message here from Swapnali Barua. Swapnali, where are you responding? Where? Are you? Oh, from Saudi. Okay, yeah. From Saudi Arabia. Okay, good. Now, yes, that is what, that is what, uh, Ms. Anila said, Professor Anila said that he, in Kerala also, welfare, economics, and human development. Now, you see, the concept of public action in Amartya Sen's work is like this. You have public action. What are the component parts of public action? Hmm? The component parts of public action are public action from above and public action from below. Hmm? By public action from above, what, what Sen and his collaborator address 
There's a very famous book called Hunger and Public Action. It's part of a four book series. Please, uh, any, any student of development economics should be familiar with the arguments in uh, Hunger and Public Action. The, uh, so what he says is, what is public action from above? Public action from above is the action of governments, laws, regulations, legislation. As I said, say, say, issuing a regulation that, or issuing an order that twenty thousand rupees will be reserved for, uh, will be reserved for the for something. Issuing a regulation that nobody will go out, that lockdown is issued, or issuing a regulation that uh, testing will be free for for uh, for people of so and so income, and so on. These are all actions, laws, regulations, uh, law and order functions. All of these are public action from above. Then you have public action from below. Public action from below, in Amartya Sen's conception, has two activity, two parts. One is uh, adversarial action. Huh? When you suppose your your suppose your village. That doesn't happen in Kerala, but suppose your village does not have a school. You protest and say we must have a school. That is an adversarial action. Yeah, you know, when you see the state as an advert, when you take an adversary's position, you make a demand, or you say that so and so, uh, this assistance has not reached my village. Suppose we have promised uh, that kits are going to be distributed. You say kits have not re reached my village, and you make your, you take an adversarial action. The second as so public action from below, I said it's two parts. One is adversarial action. The second is civic cooperation, acts of civic cooperation. Acts of civic cooperation may be many things. It may be, you know, it may be the act of voting is an act of civic cooperation. The act of not dirtying a public source of water is an act of civic cooperation. But I think that in Kerala, the, let's start with that. These acts, firstly, public action from above in Kerala means public action not only at the state government level, but at the district level, block level, and uh, panchayat level. And, and of course, in the urban municipality and ward levels. The, so in other words, public action from above is highly decentralized in our state. That itself makes it very different. Then we have public action from below. We have people who are always willing to state in Kerala. Everyone's willing to state when they don't get something. They're willing to make their protest known. But people in Kerala are also willing to, to join in acts of civic cooperation. Uh, very much. Look at, the, look at during the floods. Look at how the fish, fish workers of Kerala came out that is an act of public action from below, an act of civic cooperation. When the chief minister asked for volunteers in the COVID, it was oversubscribed. In the first few days when we had to open up kitchens for people, what an enormous response there was from the people. All of this is, of course, hugely helped by uh, education and higher levels of literacy and schooling in Kerala. But this combination of public action as acts of government and public action as acts of civic cooperation. And you see, people are irresponsible. Suppose people are irresponsible, they gather in large crowds and they, you know, they, uh, without caring for others, they, uh, they break the rules in Kerala. There's always, people don't like it. They say, you know, we have, there's got to be there's got to be civic cooperation. When Subhiksha Kerala was announced, when our new programs for uh, enhancing agricultural production, vegetable production, when our new programs for improving water bodies in Kerala were announced after Subhiksha Kerala, there's enormous public participation. So this, co uh, this combination of public action at many levels from above, that is many different types of government action, right from the state level to the lowest level. And see, as I said, the state action, 
public action by the state itself covered issues of hunger, shelter, medical care, and information. No other state has information being given to the people directly by the chief minister at least three times a week. Or no other state has the kind of access that we have to our local uh, uh, elected representative. So public action on the one hand from above at all levels and public action on the other hand in the form of civic cooperation, which is something very inspiring about Kerala, the kind of public response that comes in times of crisis. We have seen it every time. We saw it during Oki. We saw it in 2018. We saw it in 2019. We saw it even in 2020 during the mudslides in various places. You remember, I think you saw during the when the plane, uh, aircraft disaster took place in Koriko. Look at the public response, braving any kind of braving the rain, braving what braving uh, infection. People went in. People went in. Part, you know, in an act of civic in an act of civic cooperation, they came together. So at this in these times of difficulty and crisis. There's a magnificent combination. There has been a magnificent combination of public action from above and acts of civic cooperation by the people. This is, I think, our greatest hope. And uh, as I said, thank you all. Thank you all. I've probably exceeded my time. Uh, I've uh, thank you particularly to the postgraduate and research department of economics. I look forward to meeting many of my young friends here. In, in person sometime. And uh, I wish, once again, let me wish the online national lecture series in your three-day webinar great success. I hope I haven't left out anything very important. But uh, thanks once again. My greetings and good wishes. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Actually, when you talked about the uncertainties of the COVID times, your expression, how we will be able to come together, meet, and start constructive activities in the near future, or uh, it will take long time. You express the the the, the, the uncertainties and also the the, the, the kind of uh, depression that people are in. Kerala people, they are all cooperating, but they are also a kind of depression there uh, with. Uh, not a uh, regular income coming from Gulf, not uh, their uh, small business not functioning, not uh, when uh, their children are not uh, able to go to some uh, workplace after their graduation. Even the graduation process itself is uh, lengthy because we have our human development uh, uh, You have comment about the public now. Of course, it is a general will of the people to do that, but we need resources. You talked about that, GST, uh, the present time, uh, the national education policy. It is revamping the entire educational process. When, uh, but uh, those are not how it is going to be budgeted. So, this is a particular time when we find that Kerala society is injured by this kind of, um, they are saying that uh, they are going to give the responsibility to the, uh, to the corporates or for the, to the film. Uh, you, you cannot comment on all those things, but uh, I know uh, the constraint of resources itself is a very big from the planning board, you know it better than me. So thank you for the presentation. And um, I don't know whether the, the um, organizers have time for anybody to ask you questions, or uh, you would uh, have time for that. I don't know. But um, as, a, as a moderator, I would like to uh, uh, tell the participants they can ask at least a few questions, very short, uh, so that he will be able to answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The floor is open for discussion. Participants can ask questions. Excuse me, can you hear me, sir? 
ഹലോ in this present scenario we can say that macro level planning and local level implementation of policies with micro management can be considered as the cornerstone of kerala model of development and how this will help to showcase ourselves to the world uh, at at the present situation as our former president dr apj abdul kalam told the ignited mind of youth is the most powerful resource on the earth uh shall we utilize this resource in any particular ways and uh, shall we implement any policies regarding uh, this methods to eradicate this particular uh, economic and strategic conditions in your personal view uh, what about these thoughts so i think your mic is off mic is not audible let me take one or two questions together let me take one or two questions together anybody else anyone else shall i take one or two questions together no so please carry on okay let me uh, okay I, I, sorry anyone no okay let me i'll respond to both actually i'll respond to uh dr philip and uh, and to grayson kenny well, one is a uh, this is a, i understand this this issue and you know it it's not only an issue of kerala but an issue of india and of the world indeed the disorientation the profound disorientation that has taken place is not only an economic disorientation but also a personal and psychological dis- disorientation for you know the uh, often impl- has involved that and uh, the enormous problems that have come with for individuals because we have to comply with certain rules uh, in order that in order to contain the in order to contain the epidemic the pandemic we have to comply with certain rules and yet compliance takes its toll on economic activity and and uh, livelihoods which you know so there there's a sort of cycle there which is extremely uh, distressing over this is a this is something we just have to deal with what what this you know we all have to get together to to to, to deal with that's uh, what can i say except that that um, we cannot allow our uh, vigilance to flag we have to do both on the one hand seek every opportunity in which that we can to improve livelihoods and occupations on the other hand you know to ensure that every compliance that is necessary is complied with it's a very it's a very delicate and difficult balance it's difficult for the individual it's in, it's much more difficult for for society as a whole and uh, but there is no getting away from it that's the uh, that's the real and i think that there's been a lot of studies of this actually among the most uh, significant the, the the persons among among whom the most significant impact of this phase has been on uh, youth you know youth who are either coming into the work for who have just finished their uh, uh, studies either they're in their studies they've just finished their studies early entrance into the work into the workforce or young people who started small businesses you know or for all of them this has been a very difficult period and will continue to be the effects will be lasting and uh this is something which all economic and social policies 
must deal with. And, but there's no avoiding it. I mean, there's no avoiding you know, uh, sort of observing the social restrictions that are necessary in, in this period. My uh, plea is that we, are, we have the great advantage of living in a society where there is public advice available on these issues. You know? And a public consciousness, both among the people and the government, huh, of the specific nature of the economic, social, political, and psychological hardships that the people are undergoing. That is our, perhaps our advantage, that, uh, that these problems are in the public sphere, and there's a certain public confidence that they're being dealt with. Uh, I won't go into the details of you know, the educational policy and uh, finances and so on. We'll have to, uh, but I'm most happy to enter into a dialogue with you, Dr. Joseph, uh, Dr. Philip, anytime uh, uh, on, on this matter. As for uh, Grace and Kenny, I agree with you. All are in over this period. There are two things. I will, one is in the sphere of regular policy. I believe that and our, uh, our, the orientation of our policies and of, of our plan schemes for the last few years have been in this direction, that our overriding task is to create modern, skilled, decent, and well-paying employment for youth. We have to be able to attract our own youth to developing Kerala is on the map of the world because we have created a regime of human development that that does not exist did not exist at these levels of levels of income elsewhere particularly in, in the spheres of health education and uh, and social justice but we must deepen and broaden these achievements in order to develop our society into a highly productive, into a society where the forces of production in industry, agriculture, and the services are greatly enhanced. And this can only be done huh, if we create the opportunities for modern, highly high-skilled, and well remunerative uh, uh, employment opportunities for youth. This is the task we are, we are setting up. We have set ourselves, we are setting ourselves, and without that, you know, and that, only that can ensure a satisfactory, progressive future. There's no question of that. So I agree. My, my basic response to you is I agree. I agree. That's what I have to say. Anybody else? Dr. Philip? Yeah, I mean, um, you are uh, that concern uh, that happened to Kerala in this particular field. I think uh, we need some kind of a a concrete proposal like a um, theoretical uh, abstract or philosophical one from you more than the planning and distribution of scarce resources among us we yeah. need to have a generational jump in our uh, capabilities and uh, Correct. Um, you agree. know creative faculties yeah. so you are a period in this planning board i hope you will be able to write something on this especially on education on skill training on um, uh, the national um, uh, scenario. Yeah. Is that a, is that a question or is that a is that a comment? I mean, I, I, I was I was hoping that uh, you would uh, uh, address these issues in addition to your responsibilities in the planning board. You would address these issues. 
uh, in the context of covid and also in the context of uh, kerala's uh, amartya sen's uh, uh, that uh, kerala with uh, uh, mathematics and uh, this awareness has been able to achieve this but uh, yes. that uh, capability you know is not going to stand with us uh, for the 2021 onwards yeah what, what, what we believe that's what i'm saying that unless we are able to deepen and broaden these uh, yeah. and use them use these uh, advantages as a springboard for the development of production hmm? yes and the creation of modern employment for youth in other words you have to take a uh, exactly what you said you have to take a qualitative leap both in the spheres of production and of course within the spheres of education itself particularly higher education yeah that's what i meant i i agree with you thank you if okay if there is no question i think uh, the what of thanks will be followed okay sir okay sir thank you thank you sir now i invite mr arvind chandrayan assistant professor and program coordinator to propose the word of thanks is it audible for you yeah Thank you, sir. Good evening to all. Respected Principal Dr. Vargis Mathis, sir. Honorable Chief Guest Dr. V. K. Ramachandran, sir. Respected Moderator of the session, Dr. P. J. Philip, sir. Other dignitaries and academicians who are attending this program, the research scholars and students. As we are coming to the close of the first day of the online lecture national lecture series organized by the Department of Economics, Marthama College, Tiruvalla. it seems that the program is right on the track of its fundamental objective of academic enrichment in spite of the constraints imposed by the global pandemic we are fortunate to be able to conduct a high level academic discussion on the impact of the pandemic on the economy through this online platform now let me move on to the duty bestowed upon me first and foremost i would like to thank dr vk ramachandran sir vice chairman of kerala state planning board who had delivered the inaugural online lecture on kerala economic initiative during covid pandemic being an acclaimed expert in the discipline and the vice chairman of the largest policy making institution in the state the knowledge and insights imparted by him during this lecture was valuable we are really fortunate that the first edition of our online lecture series has been inaugurated by such an eminent personality in the name of the college and the department of economics i extend our wholehearted gratitude for spending your valuable time for making this program a success thank you dr vk ramachandran sir this academic discussion would have been incomplete without dr pj philip former principal of st thomas college kodangeri who moderated this session dr pj philip sir has always been warm and generous in joining hands with our department for different academic programs being a renowned academician he very well managed the width and depth of the discussion in the name of the college and the department i sincerely thank dr pj philip sir thank you sir this program was materialized due to the support given by dr vargis mathi sir the principal of the college he not only leads the college from the front but also offers all the necessary support for the various academic endeavors in the name of the department i extend my sincere thanks to dr vargis mathi sir thank you sir words are insufficient to mention the constant inspiration and encouragement by dr ick john former principal of the college as well as former head of the department of economics the interest shown by him in academic endeavors has no parallels even after retirement from official career in the name of the department i extend my deepest gratitude to dr ick john who has been the source of inspiration behind this program thank you dr ick john sir i would also take this opportunity to thank the office of the vice chairman of planning board especially dr harshan who gave us all the support to facilitate the lecture by the chief guest thank you all 
the real success of this program is determined by the participants who attended this program. Despite the fact that online meetings are the new normal, academicians, former teachers, teachers from various colleges, postdoctoral and research fellows have managed to participate in this discussion. In the name of the college and the department, I sincerely thank all the academicians, former teachers and teachers from various colleges who attended the program. And I also thank all the postdoctoral and research fellows who participated in this program. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the students from various departments who attended the lecture and made use of this opportunity for academic enrichment. Once again, I extend my sincere gratitude to all and I apologize if I left out anyone. Thank you, Onanda. Uh, thank you all. We close the session for today. Thank you, Ramajandran, sir, for being with us for today's session. And we will rejoin at 3.30 p.m. tomorrow by for the section, uh, session by Dr. M. Suresh Babu. Thank you. <laughs>